started this off naturally, right? Okay, so um, my name is Melissa Dodd, and I'm the city manager here for the city of Bellbrook, and I just want to say thank you so much for everybody coming out. This turnout is really great. Um, I've been so excited about this night um, for a long time, so thank you so much for coming out and supporting the city and providing your input and uh, just hearing what we uh, have to present to you tonight. So just a little bit about what we're doing. I'm going to kind of frame it up for you guys. So um, as everybody pretty much knows, um, I'm a new city manager. I started in April of 2018, and one of the things that really drew me to Bellbrook is, A, I've been, I don't live in this area, but I've lived in, uh, I don't live in Bellbrook, but I've lived in uh, Xenia Township my whole entire life. Uh, my mom worked at uh, Carriage by the Lake on Lakeman, which I know has had a few iterations since then, but uh, she worked there for many, many years. I played as a kid in Eagle Land, so I've, I've came through this community in my whole life, and so when the opportunity presented itself for them to select a new city manager, um, I, I knew that it had to be what I was meant to do. So I took a gamble and I got the job. And one of the things that really excited me about starting is just the opportunity that this community has to just, you know, be even better than what it is. I mean, this community is strong in a number of ways. Um, I, we can stand here and rattle off all of those things all night, but. Um, it, it could be just a little bit better. And our downtown is really, should be a point of pride and it's something that we could pay a little bit more of attention to and that we could take to an, a whole nother level and make it just a little bit better. So that's kind of what we're here uh, to talk about tonight. So um, I'm one person and um, we're a very small staff uh, with the city of Bellbrook. And so I've tried to uh, implement a lot of initiatives. And again, I'm only one person. so. Um, I, I talked council into allowing us to bring somebody in that had a whole lot more expertise than what any of us do in this area. So uh, we hired Jeff Sigler, and he's going to be uh, coming up here in just a moment to present to you guys. So this is going to this is going to be a presentation. It's also going to be a conversation. So I really want you guys to you know engage and uh, let's 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 do this without further ado. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. So thank you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Melissa. I've never had one of these crazy uh, microphones on. I feel like Tony Robbins and I should jump around and get people pumped up. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do the exact opposite. I've got 100 slides of text, and I'm just going to read off every single one. Yeah, isn't that the worst when people read off their slides? All right. Um, Thanks for having me, Melissa, very much. Uh, it's been um, nice to, to have the chance to work with you, and it's great to, to be here and work with all of you. Um, I love uh, communities. I love small towns. I, uh, um, that's why I do what I do, because it matters so much, and those connections that people have to one another are really what life is all about and what um, I think makes people feel enriched in, in a full sense of life. And, um, and that's why I got into this, because, of, you know, all too many places where that wasn't the case, where people, because the downtown had deteriorated and the sense of community deteriorated, people no longer kind of enjoyed that, um, that strong sense of community, that richness that comes with small town life. So um, that's what I am here to, to try to talk about. Um, so this is going to be kind of my story, my story and the story of downtown. I, I found out in going through this process of putting together this presentation, my story and the story of downtown are... are sort of inextricably linked, so I'm going to talk a bit about myself while I talk about, you know, what happened in downtown and then talk a bit about what we're going to try to do here and learn a bit about um, what you all, what you're finding in Bellbrook and, and your thoughts and feelings and, and so on. So without further ado, we will jump into to my story. Um, I grew up in Lima uh, at the peak of fashion. Um, you know, here we, here we all are. Um, what, you know, you guys are, are probably a bit familiar with Lima, just up I-75. In going through all this, I kind of realized that there was a, a, a whodunit. The story of downtown is kind of a whodunit. There was a, a grand heist. Um, you know, these communities all had money. Lima was an incredibly wealthy community. All these communities had, had a lot of money and resources at one time, and then it kind of went away. Uh, and communities really struggle with that now. And I was, uh, in thinking about this and in working the, for, with this for a long time, uh, I was trying to put the pieces together and figure out, like, 
where did this happen? How did this happen? Who did it? And I think I've finally solved that, and that is what we are going to discuss. So Lima, like so many other towns, was um, settled by people that came from another place. You know, people moved uh, uh, across uh, seas and, and came to this place and built a life for themselves and, and for their families and thought that, you know, we've made it. This is a wonderful town that, that we can grow and build and, and, you know, make a living and, and raise our family and, and they can raise their family and et cetera. And, and Lima was, was not unlike that, not, un, not unlike any other place where people were proud and felt a strong sense of community. Um, that isn't necessarily the place I grew up in, but that was the story that I always heard. And, and so often today, like the story of, of downtown that we hear is, is just one of the old days. You know, that, like the story's over, but we're gonna keep telling what, what it used to be. Um, a place where you, you could feel safe in making those investments and then put a business and establish a legacy. But again, that is, is not, you know, this Lima of yesteryear wasn't necessarily what I came to know. Um, but these towns, downtowns and cities are fascinating because they, they reflect the people that came and settled them. You know, the, the, whether it's German heritage or, or Czech or Italian, you know, these, these buildings reflect the craftsmanship and the styles of somewhere that somebody from somewhere else brought with them. And that's, you know, you don't look at Target and be like, ooh, that, that you know, clearly somebody from, from southern Italy developed that Target. Um, that's all been lost, and that's really sad because what makes these places unique and special is, is that craftsmanship that, that it was honed over generations and, and what makes something unique. Uh, and then those businesses that go in there that, that used to populate a downtown, be it cobblers or butchers or bakers or, or um, you know, uh, different, you know, whether it was clothing store, but those, those businesses that we all still flock to, we all still go to places like that. But most of our towns don't, ha uh, um, don't contain those anymore, those sorts of businesses that are, that are unique and special. Um, you know, and this is where my story, uh, the story of my family and, and, and Lima and revitalization are, are sort of inextricably linked, that, that, you know, my grandfather thought the same. My mother's father thought, hey, Lima is a great place. It's where I grew up. It's where uh, I'm going to stake my claim. It's where I'm going to establish a legacy. And, I mean, I'm, there might be some people that drove past this uh, years ago. Um, Davis Plaza Motel was right there on I-75 um, at in 65, I believe, in, in Lima, and that's where, you know, he made his living. That's where he raised his family, and that woman up in the corner putting is my mother. So, um, and it wasn't uh, just my mother's father, but my, my father's father um, did the same. You know, he started a, a, a food distribution company in Lima, and same sort of thinking uh, that, you know, in, in creating this business and being a local businessman. I'll establish myself as somebody important in the community. I'll help this community, but I'll also establish a legacy and something to pass down to, to my son and his son and et cetera, um, you know, so that they have a sense of security. And, and there's my grandfather in the upper corner and my, my father and brother and sister in the lower corner. Um, that didn't happen. You know, those businesses never got passed down. The, that legacy was lost. Um, you know, just in the course of uh, a course of a lifetime, all those people that, that you know, built those businesses that uh, wanted to establish that legacy, that wanted to provide, you know, for future generations, that, that was mostly wiped out in the course of a lifetime. And that is an incredibly sad story. You know, that comes back to where did it all go? What happened? Where did these places that were built with pride by people with their hands, with this craftsmanship and other places, and, you know, where all these men and women who, who attempted to build a legacy and a name for themselves that was all lost. And, and um, kind of what I, I realized that there was a great heist, there was this great robbery, and we were accomplices. We as, as community leaders were kind of accomplices. You know, we were, were told um, that this is the, the way of the future. You know, that, that this is going to be a, a bright future and to have these um, to have, you know, a, a, an acre lot and to have, to, be, to have your car, to have two cars in your garage and be able to drive everywhere and to be able to get to any product that you need at Best Buy or, um, you know, whatever that, that store was, that that was really going to make our lives better. Uh, and we were all pretty excited about that. Um, but unfortunately, I, I think we didn't put enough thought into what the impact would be. You know, when, when we pushed all commerce out to the edges of the city, um, you know, 
we, we stopped, we didn't stop to think, well, that's gonna, it's gonna have to come from somewhere. Somebody has to suffer, somebody has to lose, somebody isn't going to still continue to be able to do that business. And, you know, that's what happened. And, and those buildings and, and those businesses that once created the center of our community, that once made up the wealth of our community and where we, you know, felt some sense of ownership and pride, that was all handed off. We, we kind of seeded that, we let it go, we let somebody else do it because we thought that was the right direction. We thought it was the right thing to do. Um, unfortunately, we were incredibly wrong about that. Um, you know, those businesses are all gone. Those families are mostly all gone. Um, you know, I, I, Chamber of Commerce for, in most cities is really having a tough time being relevant anymore. And it's like, yeah, it's understandable. They don't have the same business community or this backbone of the community made up of, of you know, local men and women that own businesses, that own buildings, that, that, um, that helped drive this community forward, that were leaders there, they're gone. Um, and, and now we have a lot of you know, national chains and out-of-town people that, that kind of have all that ownership, that really own most things in our community. And, and so, you know, it, it's not, I guess it shouldn't be such a surprise now that, that our communities don't feel that same sense of pride or ownership because we've really uh, turned that over to somebody else. Uh, and, and that's sad. And even those, you know, this is the American Mall in Lima. I mean, that was, that. how many businesses did that put out of business? And now it's gone, and it's been out of business, and it's just a parking lot. So these things are, are really temporary. This is a photo uh, we took in, in Lima back in March. Um, and this was not far from where my father's business was. And, and, you know, how sad that is, because there was a time when this business, this building housed, I mean, this is somebody's, this building was in essence somebody's business. Somebody owned this. Maybe they lived in it. Maybe they rented it out to a business and a tenant, uh, a residential tenant. Maybe their business was in there. But that was a source of income and a source of pride for whoever built it. There was a business that used to be in there that's no longer there. There were multiple buildings that were next to it uh, that are no longer there. I mean, that's, that's just, it, it, it's pretty sad when you think about what all the investment, all the, the time, money, love, and energy that, that went into building a place like that and how it was all, how it's all just gone. Um, this is where the Davis Plaza Motel used to be. That's what it looks like today. It is a, inside of a clover leaf. It's an empty field, and yeah, that's that was his my grandfather's legacy. So that was thoroughly depressing. Um, <laughs> but I think it's important to understand how this happened, and you know, I, I think it, it basically was when I sort of figured out this crime. Like, yeah, we we. We thought that this thing was going to happen. We thought the future was going to be great. We thought having a car and a house in the suburbs and being able to drive everywhere and, and you know, access whatever we want and buy all these things is really going to be good. But um, so we were kind of tricked into it. I feel like as, as community leaders, we were sort of tricked. We, we opened up the vault and said, here you go. Please come in and, and you, you, know, you national chain, you can provide all the commerce. You can... You know, you can hold all the jobs. You can have all the ownership in our community. We thought that that was, was going to work out. And in hindsight, um, that was, was a pretty big, big mistake. Um, and here's why. You know, there, there's, uh, there's enough studies to prove that, that how expensive that type of development is, how much it costs. It's, um, you know, it costs a ton to, to build the infrastructure to support sprawl. It costs a ton to service that, that same infrastructure. More in fire, more in police, more in, in trash, more in, you know, then you've got to build all the infrastructure for it, and, and it's, it's, you spread a city way out. Um, you still have, the city has to still provide the same amount of services, but you've spread it so far out that, that a city really ends up um, losing a lot of money when you develop that way, and, and so city then budgets get stressed. Um, you know, it, it's, there's a lot more, or a lot less money or revenue that comes into the municipality to in uh, um, building this type of way. And, and so, you know, it just, it all goes back. There's enough statistics, there's plenty of studies to show that this was, this was a phenomenal mistake that we made um, during this, this period after the war and that we really need to rethink it and try to recover uh, and make better decisions. But we, um, you know, a lot of mistakes were made uh, in building like this. I mean, think that this is, this is an unlovable place. You know, nobody, nobody has an attachment. Nobody says, oh, I can't wait to get home and go back to that Walmart I grew up in. Um, you know, or I'm going to meet all my friends at the, the Walmart. Or, or nobody's ever walked in there and said, oh, well, you know, so-and-so owns this. I can't wait to see them and support them. These are, these are kind of meaningless places that, that fill up our countryside now. Um, 
and, and that's a sad replacement for what we once had. Um, you know, mistakes were made in essence, um, but we all you know make mistakes, uh, including myself. I, I once. I once was guilty of making certain mistakes, um, the, the mullet mistake, but as long as we learn, as long as we don't continue to have these sorts of haircuts or, or continue to wear MC Hammer pants, as long as we, we learn that we need to move away from building you know, in that style and, and start building again and, and sort of fostering density again and, and trying to rebuild our communities and bringing people back together and, making, and, and fostering local ownership again. Um, I, I think something that's really fascinating that I, I kind of realized in, in working in this field for a long time is that community really operates like a fabric. Um, that face-to-face -face interaction is, is, is what we crave and that brings people closer together. Um, and that strengthens the fabric. It becomes harder to pull apart. It, it grows more resilient. Uh, we become more resilient as a people and as a place as we see each other face-to-face -face and interact more because then we care about one another then we're more likely to help somebody out in, in a time of need. Then we're more likely to know if somebody's struggling. Um, you know, that, that, those face-to-face -face interactions are so important. And, and I actually was kind of able to find a graphic that almost showed it. This is uh, a one-mile walk in a compact neighborhood, a, a grid, a typical grid, um, that if, you know, a, a, say a kid wanted to, to go and play with his friends or go do something or go to the library, that's how far they could travel in that place. They wouldn't need a parent to take them. They wouldn't, you know they could get that far, which is access to most probably everything in the community. Um, but you go to the other slide uh, or the other photo where you know, that's how we build today. You, you can nearly access nothing from that same, in that same mile. You can't get to those connections. You can't see those people and, and you're required to be in a car then. So then all that face-to-face that -face interaction stops taking place. We stop seeing our neighbors. We stop feeling like we're a community. We, we in essence, you know, then it's just a, a series of houses and it's no longer a community. It's no longer, you know, it's no longer someplace special. So I think that there's something really important that we need to consider. We need to strengthen that fabric of community again so that our, our towns feel resilient, so we feel connected and they feel strong. Um, and that's a big part of what's happened, that, that as downtown has deteriorated in most cities, as it stopped being this place where you go for everything, when it, you know, when you don't, walk downtown to, to go to the ice cream shop or, or to go in your dad's business or to go and see, you know, um, to, to whatever all the different things that, that downtown makes up or the coffee shop, you stop having those interactions and, and we start to pull apart. And I mean, it's no surprise, like, our politics aren't great these days. Um, I think that's a large, large in part because we no longer interact face to face and talk to one another about how we're doing, you know, what's the weather, how's your lawn, et cetera. I think that, that in bringing people back together, we can start to uh, fix some of those issues. Um, so like uh, so many people, you know, I left. My whole family left. We all left Lima. Um, we realized that there wasn't sufficient opportunity. My parents had to encourage it. They realized that this isn't, you know, the community's deteriorated. It doesn't have enough to offer. It might, might not be a place where you can go and kind of lead maybe the life that you want, where you can find those things and the, the opportunity. It might not be a place where you can experience a sense of community, a sense of, of pride. And so, yeah, within a couple of years, uh, everybody with, with you know, our last name had, had moved out of that town and there was you know, kind of nothing left, which is, again, really sad for uh, considering how deep our family had its roots in, that, in, in Lima. I took some college. I went and saw some stuff, uh, moved around, and uh, I had a chance to learn some things about community in my travels and in moving from different places. So I had, um, go ahead, I uh, was out in Livingston, Montana, there's my 76 Scout, Harvester International, wonderful, wonderful car. Um, Lived out in a little community in, in Montana called Livingston, and then uh, moved across the country to, to Brooklyn. A um, little bit of difference, kind of a, a kind of a shock. The scout was fine. The scout was, was at home in both places. Um, but I, I learned 
something really important that, that surprised me is that there was a, an immense sense of pride and a, a really strong sense of community in Livingston, this tiny town in Paradise Valley, uh, Montana, and it was the same in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. You know, there was a tremendous sense of pride. People felt very connected, and, and there was a, um, you know, Fort, to be a Fort Greene resident really meant something to people, and it, and it shocked me because I grew up in a place where that didn't mean anything. There wasn't, you didn't know your neighbors, you didn't have that, those connections, and, and nobody felt, you never heard anybody talk positively about Lima. Nobody ever said anything good about it, so there wasn't any pride. And, and so it, it kind of you know, forced me to grapple with this thing like, well, it, it's, not, it's not location, you know, it's not demographics. These, these, there couldn't be more different communities than, than uh, Brooklyn and Fort, I mean, than Fort Greene and Livingston, but, but they had this wonderful, intangible sort of feeling that I never experienced growing up. Uh, and that, that, was, that kind of sparked a, a lifelong interest in what is it that makes communities healthy, resilient, vibrant, strong, and, and great places to live. So, went and took some more college. Um, I got a job. Uh, I, I got a job coming out of uh, graduate school as the um, director of Main Street Lancaster in, over in Fairfield County. Uh, and then I got another job, uh, ran the Ohio Main Street program for about 10 years uh, out of Columbus and had a chance to work with uh, communities of all shapes and sizes attempting to revitalize their downtown. Um, about two years ago, I left my job. Uh, and then I started a consulting firm. You can see, still will work for beer. Um, and here we are. So that is the uh, bit of a long-winded story about me, but I think that it um, tried to tie it in nicely with uh, the story of downtown. And you know, my my personal story and my family's story is very much that of. of you know, a struggling Rust Belt community and how that affects you, how it changes the community and how when, you know, people don't feel the roots there anymore, when people don't feel tied, when all that, when all those legacies are lost, how that does phenomenal damage, um, you know, how that really is, is tough to recover from. Uh, and that's where we start because the whole idea of this is what do we do next? How do we go about combating these issues? How do we go about dealing with, with all this damage that's been done, this, this, sort of lack of investment and our, the way that our relationship to our community has changed over time. Um, typically, it has been my experience that community aspirations are here and their actions are, are here. Um, that there's very, seems to be very little relationship with who communities want to be and, and the steps they're taking to get there. Um, you know, I, I've uh, have plenty of experience in going to a community where, where they're struggling with their downtown and ask, well, where do you like to go? You know, tell me a bit of, about the places you like to visit, and they'll, they'll name all these cities that are incredibly walkable, and we'll actually do this in a minute. But, so they'll, they'll, they'll tell me how they like to go to these places where they park their car, they walk around, they, they enjoy these great shops, um, and then they get home and, and tear everything down. You know, they, they tear down all the buildings because they're eyesores, and you know, add more parking. It's like, well, it's funny how you're doing, you know, you say you like this one thing, but you're doing the exact opposite. Steubenville was a good example of that. You know, they asked the whole community, what do you want to see here? Vibrant downtown, walkable, attractive buildings, upper floor apartments, you know, cool little businesses downtown. It's like, okay, great, that makes sense. Why is there a bulldozer outside tearing down a whole block? They're like, oh, well, it's ugly. Like, Get, do you guys see where, you know, how the, those things don't, aren't really compatible? So what we're trying to do today and through this process is figure out, well, what, why, you know, what do you want to be as a community and what's missing? What is keeping you from realizing that? So finally, I will shut up for a minute and ask you all a question. What are, what are some places that you love? What's the community that, that somebody in the audience loves and, and kind of aspires um, Bellbrook to be? Downtown, Tip City? Oh, downtown Disney. D different direction than I would have guessed. Um, I appreciate the comment, but I'm moving on quickly from that. <laughs> um, 
What's a community that, that uh, somebody loves to visit? Yellow Springs? Okay, why? It's a walkable city, or city, it's a walkable village, I should say. Uh, there's a diversity of shop, shops there. Um, there's places, there's like a B&B, &B, a big inn and things like that that people can go and stay. There's stuff nearby for hiking or anything you're interested in doing. There's just a lot of things going on for such a small town overall. Yeah. So. All right, that's great, yeah. Uh, it's. They have all those things, and the, you mentioned the shops quite a few times. I mean, that's typically why people go to the place. Who else? What's another community somebody can think of? Okay. And uh, part of the reason is it's if you if you like to go at their biannual street fairs. It's a great place to people watch. It's, it, it's, uh, and the other thing you're going to see is uh, there are no chains there. There's no fast food restaurants. Uh, they stuck with their guns, and they don't allow those kind of things in the city, and it allows the small businesses to thrive more. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great point, right? It's, it's, it's hard to compete with somebody with billions of dollars of buying power. The other thing they have is uh, they've got a lot of a, a great amenity in that they have <clears throat> a good park system, John Bryan Park, Glen Helen, and in ways we're we've got the same thing going on here. We've got the Sugar Creek Reserve, we've got a new park over here, the Morris Farms uh, on the other side of Sackett Wright Park. Now we've got Sweet Arrow on Feedwire Road, so we've got. The similar thing going on that they have. We've got a national scenic river going through our area here, and the great and the Little Miami River. Uh, so we we've, we've got the infrastructure of of uh, some great things here in Bellbrook and in the township. Great, right. thank you. Everybody else, pick a, a night. Yes, in the back. And from. From the campus, it was walkable to go to Westerville. Westerville, right? Westerville. It was very clean, was the first thing I noticed. Um, modern looking, but not sterile. Had some character and um, a lot of food options. And so that was nice for the college students to have that nearby, but it was also great for visiting, and you could see a lot of variety in the shops there. Good. Thank you. Two that I like are Granville, Ohio awesome little town, wonderful um, outdoor little eating areas, um, unique gift shops all through the town. And another one is Long Grove, Illinois. Um, there's, there are very unique shops. There are a candy store, a Norwegian shop. It's a destination kind of town. And it's mm. not, it, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's north of Chicago, and it's just a delightful town. Thank you. What do you believe makes an ideal community? What are those, those attributes that make, a, um, that make a community special? Shops. Yep. That's um, why we go to most places. Those are, yeah, those are, seem, those items are all pretty linked, too. <laughs> it matters. It does. I mean, that, that's, he's, he's going to force the mic on you. Um, Aesthetics matter. Beauty matters. We all, tr nobody, nobody's like, oh, kids can't you know, load up. We're going somewhere ugly today. Um, we all travel to beautiful places, be it the beach or the mountains or well-preserved, attractive, aesthetically appealing downtowns. Like, boy, we don't give enough credence to how much 
beauty matters when we think about our cities. You know, when you go to a special place, it looks great. It, it, it kind of hits you in the heart and, and it makes you, it, it, it brings up all these emotions and makes you feel in a way. And we get to our communities and like, nah, whatever, just build whatever. And, and that's sad because, yeah, that, that's, our standards used to be up here for our communities and, and they keep deteriorating. And that's, that's not probably where we should be moving. Other comments, other things that, that other things that, that uh, yeah, don't, you're not going to say Disney again, are you? <laughs> Main Street. You're right. I mean, it, it's, you're right that, that they've replicated Main Street, which is what Easton has done, which is what all these malls now, these lifestyle centers do, is they replicate downtown. But unfor like, they have one property owner, so they, it's a little easier. Um, but, I mean, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. There's a lot of shops. It's, it's attractive. You know, it's cohesive. Um, it's entertaining. I mean, that's what our downtowns used to be. But... Now, most of our downtowns aren't in the hands. Most of the property is not in the hands of people that, that care. Yes? I, th I think that we're all kind of on the same page with what we feel like we want and need in Bellbrook to, to make it a, obviously walkable, beautiful plants and, and uh, you know, the scenery and entertainment and having these shops here and bringing revenue into our community. But the big question is, I think what kind of shops do people want here? What are we wanting to, what are we wanting to spend our money on? Um, you can't have. I think I, I don't know who owns the used to be bird shop and now it's like there's just like junk in the window. I don't. I, then I'm trying to say that in the nicest way possible. Um, please don't. Please don't say that in a nice you know. way. It's yeah. <laughs> Junk you is know, the nicest thing you could have said. It is, though, and I'm like, why? I mean, I, we don't have, like, a, a consignment shop in this community, for instance, like, where people can walk in and maybe grab a cup of coffee and then look at some clothes or, you know, whatever. I don't know. That's just a, something that popped in my head. Um, but I think it's just what do we want here and what's going to bring people here and to stay here. And I definitely like the ideas of, like, having like a, a tap room and some bars and things like that, but also parking is obviously a major issue and we don't want to lose some green space to make parking lots either. Um, so it seems like a little bit of a catch-22, but, <laughs> but it's well, just, I think that's like the major question is what do, what do people want here and what do we want to spend our money on? And you know, if we have 12 coffee shops, that's not going to work. We need a diversity of, of businesses around. Well, I appreciate the segue, um, I, I, and thank you. You know, I think it's first what I, I'd like to do is make, sh make sure that you're not the odd community that's like, no, we don't want to walk, we don't want local land shops, we don't want pretty buildings. Um, one of the make sure, and, and Bellbrook, like most communities, they want that. You know, the, you, you want your communities kind of look like those places that, that are, are picturesque, the places that you like to go visit. So. Um, I think it's important to establish that, yes, in Bellbrook, we want this walkable, charming downtown full of little businesses and, and buildings. So, good. Um, we're getting to the, the what, but first it's kind of, you know, what I want to talk about is, well, why? You know, it, it's, um, as far as what businesses, I guess, let me, let me kind of address that, that um, they're the types of businesses that you want here are probably the same that, that people want in other places. Like you said, you know, brewery, coffee shops, some restaurants, uh, maybe a couple little, you know, some boutique retail, the, the shops that you see in every other town. Um, that's, you know, I, I would, who would like to see a, a ice cream? Well, I guess you have the, the shed downtown, so, um, so my mistake. But, um, yeah, who would like to see pizza by the slice downtown? Pizza by the slice, like the stopping. Okay, what about, what about a brewery? All right, what about, is there a coffee shop downtown? It's in the comments, right? Okay. Um, trying to think of the other ones. Hardware store? Okay. Okay. Donuts, yeah. Um, what's that? 
a candy shop. There's, you know. So, um, what's another one? Candy shop, a convenience store. All right. Yeah. All right. So, pretty much, you know, we're all kind of on the same page there as well. Probably the businesses that you would like to see downtown are, are pretty universal in what other towns uh, have, and, and you know, we're all probably kind of on the same page with that, which is really good to know. Um, the question then is, what's keeping, why? Like, if, that's, if those are your aspirations, if that's what you want, what are your roadblocks? What's getting in the way? Why aren't you doing that? Yes, sir. in the city and, and a lot of these developers that come out a lot of these property owners that come out want to develop and, and set up a new location are looking for the incentives and a lot of times they do a study to find out who provides the most but i think a big limitation for balbrick is we just don't have that flexibility without the, the income tax okay thank you um what do other people say what what do you believe are the reasons that you know what you aspire to be isn't taking place why aren't you getting there yet this is where the, the rubber meets, meets the road. You know, why? What's in the way? What? Box stores. Okay. Sugar Creek. So there's a responsibility component to spending. Let me ask a sensitive question. Is there any money in town? Okay. Yeah. There's right. Most every town has some money somewhere. Some people do. Um, you know, we, we I get that the city budgets might be small, but there's there's money in a community. There's also volunteer hours in the community. There's also expertise. There's there's um, the community has a lot of the things it needs already. Um, Down at the, at the bottom of the hill, there's no place to expand. I mean, if you want to add all these businesses, you're going to have to tear down a lot of businesses. There's no accessibility. We have two lane roads coming in and going out in order to have more accessibility, make it easier for people to get here, you're gonna to have to tear down businesses. There is no destination beyond Bellbrook. Where is there to go? You have to make Bellbrook a destination, but topography and accessibility are gonna stand in way of that. So you're talking major investments. I um, appreciate those comments, and, and uh, I think we will address that a bit. So, you know, what, what we're trying to figure out then, uh, thanks for, for everybody uh, for your comments, is you know, how do we move from A to B? So we're talking about here's, here's what we want to be, here's the place that we love, but here are all these things in the way. Here are all these roadblocks. Um, and I think that, that, you know, it has to be a frank conversation about can we do this? Can we address some of those things? Can we build new? Um, I'm at heart of preservation, so I don't like seeing things torn down. But on the other hand, not every old building is, is great. Um, certain things weren't built well. I mean, just, yeah, there's buildings built in the 1800s that weren't built that well. Most of them, obviously, were, and, and we want to preserve those. But there's also, you know, there's a, a lot of parking that's, uh, I, I'm going to probably start a riot right here, but you know, I don't believe there's any shortage of parking. Every community thinks that they are, have the, there's not enough parking in the world, like nonsense. I, I will be the first to tell you there is more parking than you could ever use. And, and here's, we're gonna. It's nonsense. Well, 
Well, this wasn't a riot at all. This is <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And let me, let me explain a little bit for those of you, you non-believers, for you uh, parking uh, addicts. Um, what happens is that we see a decline in business and we figure out, we, we want to try to attribute it to something. Particularly, it comes from bad business owners. You know, if you're open four hours a week and you're selling VCRs and Beanie Babies, parking is not your problem. And that is, is, that's what catches on. They complain about, oh, well, you know, nobody's coming to my business because we don't have enough parking. It's nonsense. Because at the, the Sugar Maple Festival, does everybody find a place to park? Then, then, you know, case in point. Like, if people find a place to park for the big events, it, what we lack is a lack of attraction. All right? Um, I use German Village as a good example. It's a wildly successful district in Columbus where there's not a single surface lot or a parking structure, yet they may, like, Book, Bookloft and Lindy's are still getting by just fine because their attractions are so strong that people will find a way to get there. So I, I urge you to put the parking thing to rest for a little bit and think about the attraction side of revitalization, of how you put more great businesses in that people want to come visit. Um, the, the joke I used to death, you know, of, of a really bad movie doesn't struggle from a lack of seating. You know, that's, uh, you, you won't make Arby's food any better by adding more tables. Um, sorry if any Arby's franchise owners, but... Um, <laughs> you, do you own an Arby's? I saw you. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, and you have, you're going to have to lose some parking. Honestly, if you want the type of density that a healthy, vibrant district has, you have to be able to, willing to put some buildings. We're drawn to buildings. Businesses, buildings fill up with apartments. They fill up with businesses. They fill up with offices. And that density, that, that mass use of, of, of people, that, you know, all these different functions in a small, dense area, that's what a healthy downtown is. That's what it always was. And we have to be able to lose some parking and, and build new, maybe take out some structures that aren't, I mean, as long as they're, yeah, if certain historic structures do need to stay, but there are plenty of, of, there was plenty of opportunity to develop that I saw walking around the downtown today. And here's the thing. We can learn something from Back to the Future. Um, I realized that in, in working at Heritage Ohio and, and traveling around all these Main Street communities, it's so funny what it finally dawned on me is that what everybody wants to do is turn back the clock 100 years. That, that what they want their downtown to be, their community to be today was what it was 100 years ago. Which is, is, is funny. We're not, you know, this is nothing new. This is nothing, you know, groundbreaking that we're trying to do. We're trying to do something very, very old. You know, a lot of locally owned businesses, buildings that are owned by local families that are well taken care of. A lot of locally owned shops that are in those businesses. A lot of people milling about, running into each other, experiencing a strong sense of community. You know, an economy that was much more sustainable and resilient. You don't need to provide you know, goods and services to the rest of the world. You need to provide them for the people that live here. You know, and if you shopped with those people and they, those same people provided what you needed, like that's, that's the perfect model of sustainability. That's what we're trying to do is rebuild something that we already had, that we lost. And if you look at the communities that are healthiest, the most resilient, the strongest, they have changed the least in that period of time. They're the most like they were in 1900. Um, so, so when, you know, when we start talking about, well, we can't do it today, it's like, we did it once already. We already built these towns right once a hundred years ago. How is it that we think we can't do the same thing today? So here's, oh, go back, go back. Yeah, Hill Valley in 1885. You know, it, it's, it's funny, but like, look, this was some, this was how towns were built. You know, they were built by local people. Somebody would, would come to town. Put down, you know, put down some roots, put down their stakes, and say, ah, oh, well, I'm going to open up a tannery here. I'm going to open up a, a dry goods store. Uh, this store needs a building. And they built a building. Uh, and, and that's how these cities were built. And it's crazy to think that, well, that, that, the technology is beyond us to construct a building to put a local business in. Um, it's, it's not. You know, it, it should actually be something that we can manage. So, you know, in 1885, here's, here's Hill Valley being built. We move on to... Uh, 1955, where a lot of these communities were kind of the height of, of, of their power, if you will. I mean, their people lived, we, we hadn't sprawled so much yet then. People, you know, we all have nostalgia for this period, um, whether we've even lived in it or not, but we know it well from movies and books and, and the stories our grandparents tell us of this place where 
you know, you could go to the local store, you knew who owned it, you could see the, you know, you ran into a council member or uh, you know, a fireman or a police officer in these places and, and you know, you, you knew that you shared that community. You knew the person that ran that store and the building owner and that was a really special, magical place that, that made you feel good, proud and connected. Then we moved on to 1985 Hill Valley. Um, you know, we're pretty familiar with this place. This is the, you know, this is the Lima of my youth. Uh, you know, God forbid, you know, anybody would go downtown. Our parents were, were pretty clear about that. Don't ever go down there. That's, the, that's dangerous. That's the, uh, you don't want to be there. And like the heart of our community, that place that was so special was gone. And, and it, it's not like it was replaced. The function was replaced. The, you know, the idea of having a place to go shop or, or eat, that was replaced. But the center, the heart of the community, it, it's dead. It died. It was never replaced. There was no other place to put it. You can't you can't relocate it to the edge of town, it just goes away. And that, you know, in effect, when you kill the heart, you kill the, the body. And that is, is, you know, the story of many a downtown, but not Hill Valley. Not Hill Valley, 2015. Um, it's kind of funny uh, uh, how um, they, were, they were wise. Uh, Robert Zemeckis knew what he was talking about when he... Um, Put, uh, made the Back to the Future movies. You know, they experienced, we don't have the flying cars yet, and I, I'm sure somebody's complaining about parking in the back. Um, where do you park a, a flying car? But, you know, it, it, it's, it was revitalized. If you look at that, that future now past, uh, that's a healthy, vibrant downtown again. Um, so, yeah, like, this, this isn't something that's impossible. It's something that very much can and needs to be done, because if, you know, they can fix Hill Valley, uh, anything can be done. So, um, so to take the cheesy metaphor of Back to the Future even further, um, what we're trying to do here with, with revitalizing communities um, is something that, that I think a town has to do. I think that it's, it's an imperative that we fix these places, that we make these downtowns healthy and vibrant. Again, because, man, if a community is not gathering, if they're not getting together and experiencing one another in that sense of community, um, something special is lost, and there's nothing to keep people here. There's no, then you don't have any roots, and there's nothing to keep your best and brightest from, from moving away. So to fix this, we need a couple different things. First, we need to know what the destination is. Um, and we established that. It's Hill Valley 2015. Um, you know, we talked about it. Everybody shared what they wanted their community to be, and you all are generally on the same page walkable, vibrant, local, you know, nice buildings, local stores, et cetera. So we, we kind of know what we want to do. Next, we need a vehicle in with which to get there. We need a sweet DeLorean. Um, we need the, a mechanism, the means to, to achieve this vision, a vehicle in with which to get there, which we are going to discuss. And finally, we need a route. How are you going to do it? What, what, what way are you going to get there? How do you go about achieving this, this uh, revitalized place? And that is my role. That is what uh, I'm here to talk about, and ultimately what's going to be the result of this whole process is getting you to a place where you know the roadmap, where you can get in your DeLorean and get to Hill Valley of 2015. Uh, how do you get Bellbrook back to, or to the place where you aspire uh, for it to be? Um, all right. So it's... What's the plan? How do we go about um, matching your aspirations with your actions? Uh, how do we, what, what direction do we take? How do we do this? And this is, you know, been, been working in this for, for quite a while, uh, working with lots of communities and kind of walking through this. Um, I come to the conclusion there's five major areas that we need to work on, that we need to, that for a community to be, to match its aspirations, to meet its goals, to, to achieve its vision, you have to have a capacity. You've got to have the capacity to do things, these things. You have to have the ability. You have to have that vehicle in which you accomplish these things. You have to deal with real estate. You know, the key to downtown is, is we talked about businesses over and over. Businesses need space. They need to go in a space. So we've got to deal with real estate. Aesthetics came up. We have to talk, uh, uh, address the aesthetics issue. You know, beauty matters, and we need to be um, we need to be proud of our place. Communityness, um, it's this idea of, of feeling together, a bond with our a relationship with our place and one another, and finally identity. So, C R A C I or C 
cracky. Um, no, that's, it's not a useful acronym, actually. Um, but the, the point being um, is that these are the five areas that we need to address. Uh, and these, the, when it comes time to make these recommendations uh, about how to go about revitalization, they're going to be broken up into these five major areas because that's, that's what we need to do. So um, first is capacity. You've got to have a mechanism to take on this work. You've got to have an organization. What organization is currently responsible for making Bellbrook a better place to live? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Congratulations, Melissa. You are a one woman quality of life organization. Um, I, that's kind of an issue. I'm not uh, discounting her miraculous ability to get things done, but it, it's insufficient. Um, there really has to be some sort of organization and community that's responsible for making it a better place to live. That's the, that's, we've got an organization for everything, except this one thing that's really, really important is making it a better place to live. And that's a huge oversight. But I mean, you're not alone in that. No, no community really does, or so few do. So we need to have capacity. We need that DeLorean. We need that, that entity that is solely concerned with how do we make this a better place to live so that, that there's a little less, so that Melissa can share the burden a bit. Um, you know, Chambers. I, 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 Chamber was a, 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 was a one time incredibly relevant and strong organization and community because you had this big business community. And man, that, that really was like some of the backbone. Those men and women involved with the chamber really were community leaders and drove it forward and were concerned with that. But as we don't have that same sort of ownership, we don't have that same sort of business community, unfortunately, um, that it's, they're tough. I mean, chambers are really struggling around the country to, to play that same role. And, and so I think we need to start to think about, you know, tourism's the same. There's a lot of tourism organizations. It's like, you know, we're not, we don't need to worry so much about people coming to our town. We need to worry about the people that are already here and make it great for them. And what we see is that when a community becomes a great place to live, people are, are going to show up. You know, those, uh, same with economic development. You know, where there's a lot of organizations solely concerned with economic development. You're not going to job your way to a great community, but you can make your community great and then realize a lot of, uh, of jobs and investment. So we need a quality of life organization. Strong, strong, strong leadership. The best leadership in the community. People that have already proven that they are, are willing and able to lead, that they have um, passion, that they have dedication, that they're able to, to get things done. Um, real commitment. You know, the problem we have with most nonprofit boards is that we're, we, um, we're implicit. Like, oh, well, if you're on this board, you know, uh, you won't have much to do, it's not much work, and you know, it's an hour a month, and, and it's easy, nothing will be asked of you. Like, well, that's a, it's kind of a stupid way to go about doing anything. Uh, a lack of prior commitments is not qu a qualification to join anything. You know, it's like, well, if you're free at six on Mondays, you're perfect for our board. Um, that doesn't cut it. We need something way more, and we know that people rise to expectations. Think of this as a job. You know, if you're going to be on this board that's concerned with the quality of life, you better be damn serious about it. You better show up. You better get things done in between the meetings. You better be willing to get new people involved. You better be willing to have a party at your house to talk to people about, you know, legislation that you want to see passed about vacant property or something. Um, it, it's not one of these where we can say, like, well, uh, you know, this is going to be an easy board to be on because that, that's not, you know, I, I have friends that think that, like, oh, I'm going to lower my standards and I'm going to get more dates not a good dating strategy and, and not a great board commitment strategy. Um, we need to be really explicit about what we want in terms of board members. We need to um, be willing to fire board members. Uh, we got to have accountability. You know, nothing, 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 nothing is, works unless we have accountability, whether it's at a job, whether it's, you know, we, we've got too many kids and, and unless we make them accountable, they don't ever do anything. Um, you know, they, they, they can achieve everything on Snapchat and, and you know, Instagram, but they achieve very little in terms of chores unless we have some sort of accountability. So we need, this board has to be accountable and to say like, look, if you didn't get done what you said you were going to get done, 
the rest of the board is going to say something. You know, we're going to bring it up. We're, we're going to hold you accountable. Um, this is, goes back to those ideas of standards. We've let our standards slide. Well, once we wouldn't accept, um, we, we've acquiesced and we accept, whether it's um, you know, a property falling into disrepair, whether it's somebody wearing their jammies to Walmart. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we used to think, oh, that, that's not okay, that we've come to accept, and like, we need to reverse that trend and start to ask more. And it starts with a great board and asking a lot of people to get, in, that get involved. Um, so, so that capacity is the first thing of whether it's an existing organization or creating a new organization, but that entity that is going to lead the way, that's going to take charge, that's going to see to it that this work gets done. Because unfortunately, without that entity in place, none of this really um, gets done. We've got to deal with real estate. You know, again, it came up, well, we need good businesses, we need good businesses. If you don't have a place for them right now. There's no place to currently house a good business. If the greatest business in the world and the business owner, you know, who was, was just knock your socks off, showed up and said, hey, I can't wait to put my business somewhere in your downtown, where would you put them? You, it's, this is very, very often the case. We assume that, oh, if a new business showed up, man, that'll fix everything. Currently, there's not a great place to put them. And that's a real estate issue. You know, good, businesses, good business owners aren't seeking substandard space. And most downtowns are filled with space that is not ready or prepared for a good business. You know, just as downtown real estate is, is, a, is a crazy thing. Nobody, nobody goes to sell their home and, and doesn't bother to sweep you know, or, or vacuum or anything. But downtown, for some reason, you know, it's this whole different way of thinking. That space needs to be in great shape. It needs to be well maintained if we expect good businesses to come in. And if it's not well maintained, if it's not ready, then we have to take action. Um, we have to go back one, actually. You know, we, red tape's not a bad thing. We had a conversation about this earlier, like red tape is not a bad thing. We've got this notion that any red tape or regulations or enforcement is anti-business. Like, no, no, no that's, 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 that's not true at all. Real investors are not seeking ease of use. Real investors are not seeking, you know, the Wild West in terms of, of codes. Um, as uh, a property owner said in the earlier meeting, like, the, the scariest thing is a property next to me that I, that I don't have any idea what's going to happen. You know, I don't want to buy a home if the person next to me can tear it down or paint it, you know, whatever color. Um, it's the same in downtown. If there are no regulations, if there's nothing ensuring that those buildings are going to be protected, um, I don't want to put my money there. So we do need regulations. We need to make sure that potential investors feel safe investing in downtown buildings or anywhere in the community. So we really, we really need regulations. We need to step up our standards and, and lift them up. We need code enforcement to tell people, look, like this, if my neighbor's yard had six foot of tall grass, uh, you know, it would be understandable to call the city and have them come out and do something about it. If a building downtown is about to fall into the street, if it's full of trash and a huge fire hazard, how is that any different? But we're all hands off, and I don't, it doesn't make sense. Um, so, yeah, we, we can't let, you know, these deadbeat owners shouldn't get a free pass. Uh, I think it can't stand. I think that, that you know, we are, we're a little too generous, a little too lenient when it comes to these people that own buildings that aren't doing their part. And I'm sorry for whatever your story is. I'm sorry if you've had it on tough times, but more often than not, they're plenty wealthy. They just don't care. It's a tax write-off. It, it, we have to put our foot down and say, enough's enough. If you're not going to take care of your building, we're going to do something about it because it, it looks bad on all of us. You know, every person that drives through Bellbrook that sees trash in a window is making unfortunate assumptions about Bellbrook that I don't think are accurate. But what difference, you know, what difference do they know? Here's the bigger part that I've seen is that it affects people that live here. You know, if you look in the mirror and you're not feeling real sharp, uh, you know, if you don't like the way you, you look that day, that, that, that changes how you feel that day. Um, or think about, you know, when you first put in your, like, uh, put in your flower beds or whatever in the spring, how much better your house looks, how much more pride that gives you. Or when you wash your car, and when you wash your car, you like it more. It feels like, I swear mine feels like it drives faster and it's cooler. Um, you know, it matters. And it